Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, I'm Sister B and welcome to Islamic Audio Bites. We will be continuing our read from Men Around the Messenger, written by Khalid Muhammad Khalid, which we downloaded from allahsword.com. Let's read. Page 36. Bilal ibn Raba, Sneering at Horror. Whenever Umar ibn al-Khattab mentioned Abu Bakr, he would say, Abu Bakr is our master and the emancipator of our master. That is to say, Bilal. Indeed, the man to whom Umar would give the agnomen, our master, must be a great and fortunate man. However, this man, who was very dark in complexion, slender, very tall, thick-haired and with a sparse beard, as described by the narrators, would hardly hear words of praise and commendation directed at him and bestowed bountifully upon him without bending his head, lowering his eyelids and saying with tears flowing down his two cheeks, Indeed, I am an Abyssinian. Yesterday, I was only a slave. So who is this Abyssinian who was yesterday only a slave? He is Bilal ibn Rabah, the announcer of the time of Muslim prayer and the troublemaker to the idols. He was one of the miracles of faith and truthfulness, one of Islam's great miracles. For out of every ten Muslims, from the beginning of Islam until today, and until Allah wills, we will meet seven at least who know Bilal. That is, there are hundreds of people throughout the centuries and generations who know Bilal, remember his name and know his role, just as they know the true greatest caliphs in Islam, Abu Bakr and Umar. Even if you ask a child who is still in his first years of primary school in Egypt, Pakistan, Malaysia or China, in the two Americas, Europe or Russia, in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Iran or Sudan, in Tunis, Algeria or Morocco, in the depth of Africa and in the mountains of Asia, in every place on earth where Muslims reside, you can ask any Muslim child, who is Bilal child? He will answer you. He was the muazzin of the messenger, peace be upon him. And he was a slave whose master used to torture him with hot burning stones to make him apostatize. But instead he said, one, one. Whenever you consider this enduring fame that Islam bestowed upon Bilal, you should know that before Islam, this Bilal was no more than a slave who tended herds of camels for his master for a handful of dates. Had it not been for Islam, it would have been his fate to remain a slave, wandering among the crowd until death brought an end to his life and caused him to perish in the profoundest depths of forgetfulness. However, his faith proved to be true and the magnificence of the religion which he believed in gave him during his lifetime and in history an elevated pace among the great and holy men of Islam. Indeed, many human beings of distinction, prestige or wealth have not obtained even a tenth of the immortality which Bilal the Abyssinian slave gained. Indeed, many historical figures were not conferred even a portion of the fame which was bestowed upon Bilal. Indeed, the black colour of his complexion his modest lineage and his contemptible position among people as a slave did not deprive him when he chose to embrace Islam of occupying the high place which his truthfulness, certainty, purity and self-sacrifice qualified him for. For him, all this would not have been on the scale of estimation and honour except as an astonishing occurrence when greatness is found where it could not possibly be. People thought 
that a slave like Bilal, who descended from strange roots, who had neither kinfolk nor power, who did not possess any control over his life, but was himself a possession of his master, who had bought him with his money, who came and went amid the sheep, camels and other livestock of his master, they thought that such a human creature would neither have power over anything nor become anything. But he went beyond all expectations and possessed great faith that no one like him could possess. He was the first muezzin of the messenger and of Islam, a position which was aspired to by all the masters and nobles of the Quraysh who embraced Islam and followed the messenger. Yes, Bilal ibn Rabah. Oh, what valour and greatness are expressed by these three words, Bilal ibn Rabah. He was an Abyssinian from the black race. His destiny made him a slave of some of the people of the tribe of Juma in Mecca, where his mother was one of their slave girls. He led the life of a slave whose bleak days were alike and had no right over his day and no hope for his tomorrow. The news of Muhammad, peace be upon him's call, began and reached his ears when people in Makkah began to talk about it, and when he began listening to the discussions of his master and his guests, especially Umayyah ibn Khalaf, one of the elders of the Bani Juma, of which Bilal was one of the slaves. How often did he hear Umayyah talking to his friends for some time and to some persons of his tribe? Many times they talked about the messenger, peace be upon him, with words that were overflowing with anxiety, rage and malice. Bilal, on the other hand, was receiving between those words of insane fury and rage the attributes of this new religion. He began to feel that they were new qualities for the environment which he lived in. He was also able to receive, during their threatening thunderous talks, their acknowledgement of Muhammad, peace be upon him's nobility, truthfulness and loyalty. Yes, indeed, he heard them wondering and amazed at what Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with. They said to one another, Muhammad was never a liar, magician or mad. We have to describe him this way until we turn away from him, those who rush to his religion. He heard them talking about his honesty and loyalty, about his manliness and nobility, and about his purity and composure of his intelligence. He heard them whispering about the reasons which caused them to challenge and antagonize him. First, their allegiance to the religion of their fathers. Second, their fear of the glory of the Quraysh, which was bestowed upon them because of their religious status as a center of idol worship and resort in the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Third, the envy of the tribe of Bani Hashim, anyone from them should claim to be a prophet or messenger. One day, Bilal ibn Rabah recognized the light of Allah and heard his resonance in the depths of his good soul. So, he went to the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and converted to Islam. It did not take long before the news of his embracing Islam was spread. It was a shock to the chiefs of the Bani Jumah, who were very proud and conceited. The devils of the earth sat couched upon the breast of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who considered the acceptance of Islam by one of their slaves a blow that overwhelmed them with shame and disgrace. Their Abyssinian slave converted to Islam and followed Muhammad, peace be upon him. Umayyah said to himself, It does not matter. Indeed, the sun this day shall not set but with the Islam of this stray slave. However, the sun never did set with the Islam of Bilal, but it set one day with the idols of the Quraysh and the patrons of paganism among them. As for Bilal, he adopted an attitude that would honour not only Islam, even though Islam was more worthy of it, but also all humanity. 
he resisted the harshest kind of torture, like all pious great men. Allah made him an example of the fact that blackness of the skin and bondage would not decry the greatness of the soul if it found its faith, adhered to its creator, and clung to its right. Bilal gave a profound lesson to those of his age and every age for those of his religion and every religion, a lesson which embraced the idea that freedom and the supremacy of conscience could not be bartered either for gold or punishment, even if it filled the earth. He was stripped naked and laid on hot coals to make him renounce his religion, but he refused. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and Islam made this weak Abyssinian slave a teacher to all humanity in the art of respecting conscience and defending its freedom and supremacy. They used to take him out in the midday heat when the desert turned to a fatal hell. Then they would throw him naked on his scorching rocks and bring a burning hot rock which took several men to lift from its place and throw it onto his body and chest. This savage torture was repeated every day until the hearts of some of his executioners took pity on him. Finally, they agreed to set him free on condition that he would speak well of their gods, even with only one word that would allow them to keep their pride so that the Quraysh would not say they had been defeated and humiliated by the resistance of their persevering slave. But even this one word, which he could eject from outside his heart, and with it by his life and soul, without losing his faith or abandoning his convictions, Bilal refused to say. Yes, he refused to say it, and began to repeating his lasting chant. Instead, one, one. His torturers shouted at him, imploring him, mention the name of Allah and al Uzza. But he answered, one, one. They said to him, say as we say. But he answered them with remarkable mockery and caustic irony. Indeed, my tongue is not good at that. So Bilal remained in the melting heat under the weight of the heavy rock. And by sunset, they raised him up and put a rope around his neck. Then they ordered their boys to take him around the mountains and streets of Mecca. But Bilal's tongue did not mention anything other than his holy chant, one, one. When the night overtook them, they began bargaining with him. Tomorrow, speak well of our gods. Say, my lord is Alat and Al-Uzza, and we'll leave you alone. We are tired of torturing you as if we are the tortured ones. But he shook his head and said, one, one. So Umayyah ibn Khalaf, kicked him and exploded with exasperating fury and shouted, What bad luck has thrown you upon us, O slave of evil? By Alat and Al-Uzza, I'll make you an example for slaves and masters. But Bilal answered with a holy greatness and certainty of a believer, One, one. And he, who was assigned to play the role of a sympathizer, returned to talking and bargaining. He said, Take it easy, Umaya. By Allah, he will not be tortured again. Indeed, Bilal is one of us. His mother is our slave girl. He will not be pleased to talk about and ridicule us because of his Islam. But Bilal gazed at their lying, cunning faces, and his mouth slackened like the light of dawn. He said with calmness that shook them violently, One, one. It was the next day and midday approached. Bilal was taken to the sun-baked ground. He was patient, brave, firm and expecting the reward in the hereafter. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, went to them while they were torturing him and shouted at them, Are you killing a man because he says, Allah is my Lord? Then he shouted at Amaya ibn Khalaf, Take more than his price and set him free. It was as if Umayyah were drowning and had caught a lifeboat. It was to his liking and he was very much pleased when he heard Abu Bakr offering the price of his freedom. 
since they had despaired of subjugating Bilal. And as they were merchants, they realised that selling him was more profitable to them than his death. They sold him to Abu Bakr, and then he emancipated him immediately, and Bilal took his place among free men. When a Sadiq put his arm around Bilal, rushing with him to freedom, Umayya said to him, Take him for Alat and al Uzza. if you had refused to buy him except for one ounce of gold, I would have sold him to you. Abu Bakr realised the bitterness of despair and disappointment hidden in those words. It was appropriate not to answer. But because they violated the dignity of this man, who had become his brother and his equal, he answered Umayyah saying, By Allah, if you had refused to sell him except for a hundred ounces, I would have paid it. He departed with his companion to the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, giving him news of his liberation, and there was a great celebration. After the hijra of the messenger, peace be upon him, and the Muslims to al Madina and their settling there, the messenger, peace be upon him, instituted the Adhan. So, who would become the Muezzin five times a day? Who would call across distant lands, Allah is the greatest, and there is no God but Allah? It was Bilal who had shouted 13 years before, while the torture was destroying him, Allah is one, one. He was chosen by the messenger, peace be upon him, that day to be the first Muezzin in Islam. With his melodious, soul-stirring voice, he filled the hearts with faith and the ears with awe when he called, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Come to prayer. Come to prayer. Come to success. Come to success. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. There is no God but Allah. Fighting broke out between the Muslims and the army of the Quraysh who came to invade al Madina. The war raged fiercely and terribly while Bilal was there attacking and moving about in the first battle. Islam was plunged into the Battle of Badr, whose motto, the messenger peace be upon him, ordered to be one, one. In this battle, the Quraysh sacrificed their youth and all their noblemen to their destruction. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who had been Bilal's master and who used to torture him with deadly brutality, was about to retreat from fighting. But his friend, Uqba ibn Abu Mu'it, went to him when he heard the news of his withdrawal, carrying a censer in his right hand. When he arrived, he was sitting among his people. He threw the censer between his hands and said to him, O oh, Abu Ali, use this. You are one of the women. But Umayyah shouted at him, saying, Make Allah make you and what you came with ugly. And he did not find a way out, so he went to fight. What other secrets does destiny conceal and unfold? Uqba ibn Abu Muyid had been the greatest supporter of Umayyah in the torture of Bilal and other weak Muslims. And on that day, he himself was the one who urged him to go to the Battle of Badr, where he would die, just as it would be the place where Uqba would die. Umayyah had been one of the shirkers from war. Had it not been for what Uqba did to him, he would have not gone out fighting. But Allah executes his command. So let Umayyah go out because there was an old account between him and one of the slaves of Allah. It was time to settle it. The judge never dies. As you owe, you shall be owed to. Indeed, destiny would be very much pleased to mock the tyrants. Uqba, whose provocations Umayyah used to listen to and follow his desire to torture the innocent believers, was the same person who would lead Umayyah to his death. By the hand of whom? By the hand of Bilal himself and Bilal alone. The same hands that Umayyah used to chain 
and whose owner he beat and tortured. Those very hands were on that day in the Battle of Badr on a rendezvous that destiny had set the best time for, with the torture of the Quraysh, who had humiliated the believers unjustly and aggressively. This is what really happened. When the fighting began between the two sides, and the side of the Muslims shouted the motto, One, one, the heart of Umayyah was startled, and a warning came to him. The word which his slave used to repeat yesterday under torture and horror became today the motto of a whole religion and of a whole new nation. One, one, is it so? With this quickness and with this rapid growth, the swords clashed in the battle and the fighting became severe. As the battle neared its end, Umayyah ibn Khalaf noticed Abdurrahman ibn Auf, the companion of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. He sought refuge with him and asked to be his captive, hoping to save his life. Abdurrahman accepted his supplication and granted him refuge. Then he took him and walked with him amidst the battle to the place where the captives were held. On the way, Bilal noticed and shouted, the head of Kufr, disbelief, Umayya ibn Khalaf, may I not be saved if he is saved. He lifted his sword to cut off the head, which was all the time full of pride and arrogance. But Abdurrahman ibn Auf shouted at him, O oh Bilal, he is my captive. A captive while the war was still raging, a captive while his sword was still dripping blood because of what he had been doing just moments before to the bodies of the Muslims. No. In Bilal's opinion, this was irony and abuse of the mind, and Umayyah had scoffed and abused the mind enough. He scoffed until there was no irony remaining for such a day, such a dilemma and such a fate. Bilal realised that he would not be able alone to storm the sanctuary of his brother in faith, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. So he shouted at the top of his voice to the Muslims, O helpers of Allah, the head of Qufr, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, may I not be saved if he is saved. A band of Muslims approached with swords dripping blood. They surrounded Umayyah and his son, who was fighting with the Quraysh. Abdurrahman ibn Auf could not do anything. He could not even protect his armour, which the crowd removed. Bilal gazed long at the body of Umayyah, who fell beneath the smashing swords. Then he hastened away from him, shouting, One, one. I do not think it is our right to examine the virtue of leniency in Bilal on this occasion. If the meeting between Bilal and Umayyah had taken place in other circumstances, we would have been allowed to ask Bilal for leniency, and a man like him in faith and piety would not have withheld it. But the meeting which took place between them was in a war where each party came to destroy its enemy. The swords were blazing, the killed were failing. Then Bilal saw Umayyah, who had not left even a small place on his body free of the traces of his torture. Where and how did he see him? He saw him in the arena of battle and fighting, mowing down with his sword all of the heads of the Muslims he could. If he had reached the head of Bilal then, he would have cut it off. In such circumstances, as the two men met, it is not fair to ask Bilal, why did you not forgive him gently? The days went by and Makkah was conquered. The messenger, peace be upon him, entered it, thankful and saying, Allah is the greatest, at the head of 10,000 Muslims. He headed for the Kaaba immediately. This holy place, which the Quraysh had crowded with idols, amounting to the number of days of the year. The truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Ever since that day, there has been no Uzza, no Lat, and no Khobal. Man will not bow to a rock or idol after today. People will worship no one with all his conscience but Allah, who has no likeness, the one most great, most high. The messenger entered the Kaaba, accompanied by Bilal. He had hardly entered it, when he faced a carved idol representing Ibrahim, Abraham, peace be upon him, prophesying with sticks. The messenger, peace be upon him, was angry and said, May Allah kill them. Our ancestor never did prophesy with sticks. Ibrahim was not a Jew or Christian. 
he was a true Muslim and was never a polytheist. Then he ordered Bilal to ascend to the top of the mosque and call to prayer, and Bilal called the Adhan. How magnificent was the time, place and occasion. Life came to a standstill in Mecca, and thousands of Muslims stood like motionless air, repeating in submissiveness and whispering the words of the Adhan after Bilal, while the polytheists were in their homes, hardly believing what was happening. In this, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his poor followers, who were expelled yesterday from their homes. Is this really he, with 10,000 of his believers? Is this really he, whom we chased away, fought and killed his most beloved kin and relations? Is this really he, who was speaking to us a few minutes ago, while our necks were at his mercy, saying, Go, you are free. But, Three nobles of the Quraysh were sitting in the open space in front of the Gaaba, as if they were touched by the scene of Bilal, treading their idols with his feet and sending above its heaped wreckage his voice with the Adhan, spreading to all the horizons of Makkah like a passing spring. These three were Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who had embraced Islam only hours ago, and Atab ibn Usaid and Al-Kharith ibn Hisham, who had not yet embraced Islam. Atab, with his eyes on Bilal, crying out the Adhan, said, Allah has honoured us aid in that he did not hear this, or else he would have heard what would infuriate him. Al-Harith said, By Allah, if I were sure that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is telling the truth, I would follow him. Abu Sufyan, the old fox, commented on their speech, saying, I am not saying a word, for if I do, these pebbles will inform about me. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, left the Kaaba, he saw them, read their faces instantly, and said with his eyes, shining with the light of Allah and the joy of victory, I know what you have said. And he told them what they had said. al Kharith and Atab shouted, We bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. By Allah, no one heard us, so we can't say somebody informed you and they welcomed Bilal with new hearts, which enclosed the echo of the words which they had heard in the messenger peace be upon him speech just after he entered Makkah. O people of the Quraysh, Allah has removed from you the arrogance of pre-Islamic paganism and is boasting about forefathers. People are descended from Adam, and Adam was from dust. Bilal lived with the messenger of Allah peace be upon him, witnessing all the battles with him, calling to prayer and observing the rites of this great religion that took him out of darkness to light and from servitude to freedom. The stature of Islam, along with the stature of Muslims, was elevated. Every day, Bilal was getting closer to the heart of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. He used to describe him as one of the inhabitants of paradise. But Bilal remained just as he was noble and humble, always considering himself the Abyssinian who only yesterday was a slave. One day he was proposing to two girls for himself and his brother. So he said to their father, I am Bilal and this is my brother, two slaves from Abyssinia. We were astray and Allah guided us. We were two slaves and Allah emancipated us. If you agree on us marrying your daughters, all praises to Allah. If you refuse, then Allah is the greatest. The messenger passed away to Allah, well pleased and well pleasing, and Abu Bakr as Sadiq took the command of the Muslims after him. Bilal went to the Caliph, successor of the messenger peace be upon him, and said to him, O Caliph of the messenger of Allah peace be upon him, I heard the messenger of Allah peace be upon him say, the best deed of a believer is jihad in the cause of Allah. Abu Bakr said to him, So, what do you want, Bilal? He said, I want to defend in the cause of Allah until I die. Abu Bakr said, And who will call the Adhan for us? Bilal said, with his eyes overflowing with tears, I will not call the Adhan for anyone after the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. Abu Bakr said, 
Stay and call to prayer for us, Bilal. Bilal said, If you emancipated me to be for you, I will do what you want. But if you emancipated me for Allah, leave me to whom I was emancipated for. Abu Bakr said, I emancipated you for Allah, Bilal. The narrators differ. Some of them believe that he travelled and remained fighting and defending. Some others narrated that he accepted Abu Bakr's request to stay with him in Medina. When Abu Bakr died and Umar succeeded him, Bilal asked his permission and went to Syria. Anyhow, Bilal vowed the remaining part of his life to fight in the cause of Islam, determined to meet Allah and his messenger, peace be upon him, having done the best deed they love. His melodious, welcoming, awe-inspiring voice did not call the adhan anymore because whenever he uttered in his adhan, I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah, memories would stir him and his voice would vanish under his sadness while the tears cried out the words. His last adhan was during the days of Umar, the commander of the faithful, when he visited Syria. The Muslims entreated him to persuade Bilal to call one adhan for them. The commander of the faithful called Bilal when it was time for prayer and pleaded with him to make the adhan. Bilal ascended and did so. The companions of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, who were with the commander of the faithful while Bilal was calling the adhan, wept as they never did before, and Umar the most strongly. Bilal died in Syria, fighting in the cause of Allah, just as he had wanted. Beneath the dust of Damascus, today, there lies the body of one of the greatest men of humankind in standing up for the creed of Islam with conviction. Alhamdulillah, that was the story of Bilal ibn Rabah. May Allah be pleased with him. Please do share this channel with your family and friends and please do leave a comment or review and rating. Please also check out our social media. We are on Instagram and Facebook. And if you'd like to contact me directly, please do so at sisterb007 at gmail.com. As always, hope your day is full of blessings. Assalamu alaikum.